Welcome, everybody, to the Be Kind Podcast. We're part of the Animal Advocates' mission to create a more compassionate world for all living creatures, whether they like to play their music in a major key, a minor key, read bass clef, read tenor clef, or even read treble clef. All animals deserve to be loved, and we're here to make it so they are loved. Just as a reminder, you can reach us at BeKindPodcast at gmail.com or by messaging the Animal Advocates at South Central PA's Facebook page. Like and subscribe and share on all the major podcast platforms. And today I have the pleasure and honor of being joined once again by John. Hey. And Brian. Hi, Brian. Hey. Uh, so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. We're happy to have you here, too. Thanks for being on. So, Brian, to get started, can you give us the overview of your vegan journey and what takes up most of your time and energy? Sure. Well, um, we're probably going to get on the subject of music, I imagine. So it's interesting how my vegan journey correlates directly to my musical journey. Back in the early to mid-90s, I was in a band in high school. Back then, the underground music scene in Lancaster and York and Harrisburg, all over the place, was really thriving. So I uh, went to shows all the time as a kid. Um, Thursday nights, Saturday nights, Friday nights, Sunday nights. Uh, I think there was always a show going on, like, every weekend. And part of that underground scene was, like, the straight edge movement. And I started to get introduced to veganism that way because people would show up at shows with information about veganism. And I hadn't really been in touch with that concept uh, before then. All my life, I can remember as a kid, like really connecting with animals and uh, preferring their company most of the time uh, to other human beings. So I had a lot of great pets in my life growing up and it was a big part of my life. And I can remember from a pretty early age beginning to question, you know, uh, why do we eat animals why do we eat meat once i understood that you know like hamburgers were cows and you know pork was pigs once i had that realization uh, the cognitive dissonance began and so towards the end of high school i started becoming vegetarian and then going to all these shows i was introduced to veganism and i started struggling with that concept it's like well you know i'm still eating cheese and stuff and now i understand that this is also part of a terrible terrible process that really harms animals and so it was really struggling with that and then after my high school band broke up that i was in i moved on to a different project um all american radio and our drummer travis miller he was a vegan first one i ever met in you know intimate contact with you know like constantly working with and seeing what he ate and seeing how it all worked and shortly thereafter i made the decision and have never looked back and that was close to 20 years ago. It's amazing. And, and actually, it's funny that you mentioned 20 years ago. Isn't your vegan anniversary coming up? Yeah, I basically figured out it's towards the end of February. So, yeah, the big 2 Nice. Um, yeah, yeah. It's uh, been an interesting journey. It's amazing to see how much has changed since I started um, nice. in the world of veganism. And I, I tell you, you know, looking back on things, I never thought it would be this prominent of a movement as it is now. And how it's really infiltrated like society in so yeah. many levels. Yeah, definitely. Now you were saying about Travis being vegan. Uh, so what did, what did you learn from him as you were st- not studying him, but I guess obser- <laughs> observing how he was living? Like, what did you pick up from that? Cause 20 years ago it was relatively difficult to be a vegan at that point. So, yeah, yeah. Well, just um, basically like cracking the, the codes on ingredients lists, <laughs> right? <laughs> things like casein, mm-hmm. that, you know, milk protein, they were still putting that in like everything. I don't know if you remember, there was a fake cheese, like veggie singles or something like yes, that. Yes, I remember those. Yeah. You know, and there, well, there was like go veggie and stuff like that. They're yeah, still around, yeah. but yeah, they still put that stuff in there. It's like, uh, it's so <laughs> deceiving. It was very confusing because yeah. I was like, who's this for? <laughs> right exactly vegetarians eat cheese vegans don't want to eat anything from animals so why would you go through all the trouble of making this almost vegan cheese and right. then throw milk protein in? right and then call it go veggie it's like yeah. that yeah. doesn't make any sense <laughs> so yeah that was that was strange yeah but um uh, so many things i learned from travis just really practical stuff you know i think we went to health food stores together and it basically just showed me how to get, you know, adequate amounts of protein, like what kind of food combinations like work and uh, started to learn how to like make 
uh, like fake meats and stuff at home with like sea tan and, and tofu and, and all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, it just got me up and running. And then I was always in love with food and cooking. Mm-hmm. And becoming vegan just opened me up to a whole new world of experiences. You know, just started digging into other cuisines from all over the globe and learning how to cook dishes. We jumped right into the vegan aspect of your life. But could you tell us a little bit about your music career and the bands you played in your current operations or roles in whatever band you're part of now sure sure oh but gosh i've done <laughs> done a lot um been playing music since i was a, a really little kid i got into i think my first instrument was a trombone then i moved on a saxophone uh, and then guitar and then bass and drums and etc cetera, etc cetera. got into like alternative music rock music hardcore emo whatever you want to call it when i was probably like in 10th grade um, met some friends and we formed a band. That first band was called Milkweed. Oh yeah, and then, I remember you guys. I actually have some flyers with your band. Oh wow, <laughs> that's an awesome band name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we were in that band for I would say three, three and a half years. Uh, put out one seven inch, a couple tapes, and then uh, we disbanded. Uh, and then I was working on solo stuff and teamed up with Travis and uh, Molly Sports and Tim Joyce to make All American Radio. We were around for about five years, I think. Put out two out two full length out. Well, um, one EP, split EP with a different band called Somerset, and then we put out a full length and did a couple tours. Tried pretty hard. Got got you know got kind of far. We opened up for basically all our heroes of that time. Mm. Um, so that was awesome. Nice. And after that, I uh, went into solo production and started learning how to make music with um, digital audio uh, software. Using synthesizers, samples, uh, you know, live instruments, you name it. You know, had several projects through that. None of them really prominent enough to to name here. Uh, And then I got into dance music, um, house music and all kinds of stuff um, related to that kind of genre. And I had a project called Bit Clipper, put out a 12-inch vinyl. Uh, After that, I've just been doing solo stuff, put out an album about a year and a half ago. Just put it up on um, Bandcamp, and it's also on YouTube mm-hmm. um, as a video. And since quarantine, boy, I've I think I've written like I don't know, over a hundred songs. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's uh, definitely helped me keep my sanity and uh, something to really throw myself into. And um, working with a couple friends now, we're um, after there are a couple guys that there are also in other projects, but um, hopefully sometime later this year once. Hopefully we can get together and play in person again, put a little band together. So Nice. Yeah, doesn't have a name or anything yet. But. <laughs> yeah, I actually checked out your solo stuff on uh, the YouTube, and it's really good. I, I love how it's like, it's kind of a mix. Like there's like a little bit of dancey stuff going on almost going on there, and then you have like this really like chill ambient stuff going on. It's really, I like it a lot. It's really oh, cool. Thanks, thanks mm-hmm. very much. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it gets pretty rhythmic at times. I mean, uh, my influencers are all over the place. I listen to every kind of genre of music you can imagine so but you know the ones that we're really veering towards uh with my solo stuff and the new band is um shoegaze stuff okay. if anybody knows what that is uh <laughs> i do <laughs> yeah and you know ambient stuff uh, we're kind of jokingly calling it cosmic rock okay you talked a little bit about how veganism factor into your interpersonal relationships with your fellow band members could you talk a little bit about how your veganism and your vegan ethic factors into the content of your music or the style of it basically a lot of my work is really introspective and it deals with a lot of uh things related to compassion and empathy so i'm always mindful whenever i'm creating something of those aspects of my life and you know how becoming vegan has influenced me um and then how that directly influences basically everything i do so it you know, it, it, I don't have any lyrics specifically speaking to veganism. A lot of my stuff is really instrumental. I, I don't know. I think it, it, there's certain aspects that aesthetically kind of come through. I think there's definitely like sense of um, empathy and compassion in the, the overall mood of a lot of the stuff that I do. I think that relates a little bit to veganism. Well, it does relate a lot to veganism, but I think that especially relates because with animals, we always say that there's we're the voice for the voiceless and things like that, but they do have voices. We just don't understand it. And we only understand voices with and messages spoken in human language, but there's so many different ways to communicate and put out their messages of empathy and compassion. I think your music is a great example of that, how you can have those themes and messages in there solely through the audio content, not necessarily the lyrics contained within the songs. 
Yeah, yeah. I think uh, you can translate any kind of emotion or uh, psychological concept into sound, really, and communicate that way. And, you know, animals make music, too. So <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> So uh, back to one of your bands again, uh, All yeah. American Radio. Uh, what was your role in that band? You played guitar, right? Yeah, um, live. I was co-singing, playing guitar, wrote most of the music. And then in the studio, you know, various keyboards and other strange devices for you know <laughs> to make fun fun sounds and whatnot. Yeah, so uh, it was it was collaborative though. I, I mean, I would come to the practice space with an idea. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a riff or whatever, and then uh, we'd all flesh it out together. And over the years, we had some really awesome collaborators uh, that brought really interesting aspects. Um, the one drummer, Scott Manley, who was with us for a period of time, had a, a, a fully functioning um, vibraphone. Nice. Yeah, and he would uh, play it with a bow from a violin. Um, he would run the bow up against the edge and it would make these really strange, beautiful ambient landscapes. Wow. Yeah. It's amazing because, you know, it's funny. <laughs> the other day when I sent you that flyer that I made like years ago of a oh, show yeah. I booked with you guys, like it said, it you know, the description of your band was emo or something like that or indie <laughs> or something like that. But I really didn't know what else to describe it as because it was just so beautiful and like I, it, you guys were so like experimental and unique. It was like I didn't know how to describe it because, I mean, you had like violins and like you said, you had all kinds of instruments going on and it's just... It was such a good band. I, it, oh, thanks so much. Thanks yeah. so much. Yeah, we we never really tried to peg ourselves either. We were in a specific scene mm -hmm. with you know emo hardcore bands, but we were we were not really exactly like any of those bands. Again, you know, it's like it's just part of the way I work. I take influences from anything that inspires me. I don't feel restricted to any specific mm -hmm. need to say, I, I, you know, I make this kind of music or that my music has to be this type of music. Um, re really, you know, any anything is fair game. Anything that sounds good is fair game. Yeah, absolutely. Are there any parts about being in a band or a musician that are extremely incompatible with veganism? For example something in my professional life is it's really hard to find vegan dress clothes and is there something mm. in the music world like maybe violin bows are made out of goat tendons or <laughs> uh they always have ham and cheese sandwiches in the makeup rooms before the shows or something i don't know <laughs> yeah well i think violin bows are most of them are synthetic now or maybe they still use horse hair i'm yeah. not really certain yeah, yeah. I, think, I think they are starting to do more synthetic but yeah for a long time it was horse hair yeah 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 and even drum heads they didn't start using plastic ones until uh, like probably in the like last like 20 years I or forgot so forgot about drums yeah a lot of drum heads mm -hmm. were uh what was it like sheepskin or something like that yeah yeah it was i'm trying to think for me like i don't know if there's maybe any adhesives in the production of a guitar that might be animal derived but i don't know that there's really anything to be concerned about with guitar manufacturing but yeah i think you know there are definitely certain things that would be animal derived fortunately with my current setup it's all metal and plastic so <laughs> <laughs> nice and wood but i've never had any particular situations like that mm -hmm. i would say the most difficult thing about being in a band and being vegan is when you go on tour right well especially uh, back then i would <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> the yeah. struggle had to have been really real <laughs> yeah ate a lot of bread french fries and salads yep same here and <laughs> swedish fish that was my life <laughs> yeah. um i'm sure this you know this would have been like 15, 16 years ago. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it would be, I'm sure it would be a lot easier now to do that. Oh yeah, to definitely. Go definitely. Because I mean, even you could even go to a Burger King and get, you know, an impossible burger now, which is mind blowing. Yeah. <laughs> we had a musician on a few weeks ago. We were talking about playing shows that essentially are incredibly anti-vegan, like a barbecue or something like that. Do you ever run into uh, any ethical situations along those lines? No, I never had an experience like that. I mean, you know, back then, wherever you go, the food is being served. It's, guaranteed to not be vegan. <laughs> <laughs> right but no i've never had like we've never played like shows where it was like that had a food component mm -hmm. but that actually brings up an interesting segue for a period of time uh shortly after all american radio um i did catering for ci records at the chameleon i did vegan catering for oh, nice um, yeah because uh, a lot of those bands that came through were were vegan mm -hmm. 
Um, and so anytime that happened, Jeremy Weiss would call me up and say, hey, you know, <laughs> I need you to cook for 40 people this weekend. Wow. That had to yeah. have been a challenge, <laughs> a fun challenge, uh, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was interesting. Put it that way. <laughs> what was so, some, what was some of the uh, meals you prepared? Well, pasta was usually the easiest thing. Right. So right. I would um, have have a patented recipe for a uh, marinara sauce, wow, and okay. so I would do spaghetti, and then I would make like a what I used to call the loaf, which is basically a, a homemade tofurkey. Mm. And nice. just kind of shred, shred that up and put that in there. Nice. Um, yeah, big salad, some bread. Uh, we do like a lot of falafel sandwiches. Nice. Um, stuff that, you know, you Quick and easy. Can tra- yeah, can travel well mm-hmm. and be like reheated easily. Right. Do you have any cool stories from your catering days over at the Chameleon? And for <laughs> our listeners, I believe this is the Chameleon in, that used to be in Lancaster. Yep. Yep. Yeah, the Chameleon Club. Well, this is one outside of the Chameleon Club. Uh, I think it. Um, from remembering correctly, the famous punk band Crass. Oh, go on. <laughs> um, Jeremy booked them to play a warehouse downtown Lancaster, but I think the fire chief came and, and shut it down before it could start. So this led to Jeremy scrambling and finding. Um, no, it wasn't it Crass, was it was Conflict. Conflict. I was at that right. show and it got moved to like Reading or yeah. something. No, it was. Um, it was like shoot, right out. Was it? it was like right outside of there. I think Mount Gretna. Yes, yeah, I was there. <laughs> you were there. Okay, so I catered that show, and you remember what happened? Yes, it was not huge. There was a huge standoff with um, a group of skinheads that yep. had a show going on there yep. currently, and we were trying to come in and jump in after them. And uh, conflict, you know, they're pretty political there not yes. into skinheads at no. all neither was anybody there um myself included that was working on the show or going to see the show i mean you're talking about people that are all very socially conscious and right very anti uh, fascism anti-racism and all that so mm. oh there was a contingency of skinheads and then everybody that came to see conflict and there was a stand-up john do you remember it lasted like at least an hour yeah, it was nuts. And then when the show got moved, like they cut the power and everything, and like, yeah, it was nuts. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> it was a Wild crazy times. show. And they still played with the power <clears throat> off. Like he was like yeah. screaming, and the crowd was like going insane. <laughs> that was a crazy show. I remember that very well. Yeah, it was. It was a strange night for sure. But <laughs> but they, you know, pulled it off. I managed to feed them, and everything turned out okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe that you like catered that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, what did you feed him? Was it the pasta? Uh, this was, I think, like a Moroccan couscous and veggie thing with falafel on the side. Again, a salad, probably some bread. Nice. And they were they were surprised that there was a food at all. Right. Because I guess right. you know, in in the chaos that ensued, and then and then when I told them everything's vegan, they they like all like wanted to like hug me. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> They were pretty happy about that. Yeah, because they're they are like really I wouldn't want to call them militant about veganism, but they are really like strict about it and like sure. in your face about it kind of. So yeah, they yeah. were really they, they, probably really thankful to have some kind of food that was vegan. They grilled me yeah, they grilled me for uh like I think a minute on what the ingredients I used yeah. and everything. And <laughs> and I basically had to just say guys guys, I assure you I'm an ethical vegan and everything here is one hundred percent above board. <laughs> Not nothing to worry about wow that's amazing yep. Yep. <laughs> that is a crazy story yeah <laughs> for so many reasons <laughs> that, whole, yeah. that whole night was insane <laughs> and you know that that wasn't the first time we ran up against neo-nazis and fascists yeah. coming to to the shows i don't know if it happens so much anymore but, well maybe now that back in the political eye or the public eye yeah but, before everything happened with the virus i'm sure there probably was some some drama yeah. still going on there yeah scary stuff yeah Strange. Absolutely. Maybe if you had made some food way back then, it could still be good now. But I hear there's a way to do that by fermenting it, which is my very <laughs> subtle way to transition to talking about fermented Smooth. foods. Smooth segue. This ain't my like first it. podcast episode. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I love fermented foods. It's um, it's kind of like getting to do mad science in your own home. <laughs> Can you just explain for our listeners what exactly fermented foods is? Because that word is thrown around a lot, but I don't think a lot of people really know what it means. Yeah, yeah. Well, truly fermented foods um, is a process uh, where you preserve a food, um, encourage the growth of lactobacillus bacteria, which if you have something fermented, that's what gives it, it its tartness. 
So basically, you start out with a, a vessel, like a jar, and whatever you're fermenting, say cabbage for sauerkraut, um, and you put salt in it and water, and then you regulate the temperature. And within a matter of days or weeks, you have um, fermented foods, which the lactobacillus bacillus bacteria eats the sugars and the salt feeds it to. Um, the sugars come from whatever you're fermenting, um, and it grows. And as it as it grows, it, it creates the fermentation process, um, which uh, helps preserve foods uh, because you increase the acidity, so it's more resistant to other unfriendly bacteria coming in to rot the food um, or to, you know, make a person ill. Uh, a lot of people have concerns about it because uh, there's a lot of woo-woo on the internet about how people have died or become gravely ill because of, you know, fermenting foods at home. And that really can only happen if you're doing it in a really haphazard, unsafe, unregulated way. But you can ferment just about anything. One of my favorite things to ferment now is tofu. Yeah, it comes out like uh, cheese, like uh, feta cheese. But I ferment all kinds of stuff, kimchi, pickles, sauerkraut, beets, all kinds of vegetables. And then one of my favorite things is a South Indian breakfast food called dosa, mm. which is a crepe um, that you make a batter from uh, rice and lentils. Interesting. Yeah. Look it up online. Um, it's a wonderful food. Unfortunately, you can't really... It's nowhere around here that I know that serves them. Usually I have to go up to and visit friends in Jersey City. <laughs> or, come, or come visit you <laughs> and get yeah, some. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, up in Jersey City, they have um, Little India. And oh, okay. Just some of the best food up there I've ever had. But um, I learned uh, how to make the dosa some time ago. Recently, um, in quarantine, I, I invested in a 19-inch electric griddle so I can make really big doses now. That's a, that's a game changer. Nice. Uh, at home to do ferments, I have uh, my fermentation station, mm -hmm. which is a three-tiered uh, stainless steel restaurant cart. That under the top shelf, I bought a carboy heater, which is used in the home brewing process. It's basically a flat plastic sheet with um, an element in the middle, a uh, heating element. Mm -hmm. And I, with magnets, I secured that to the bottom of the shelf, and then I plugged that into a thermal regulator, uh, creating a hot surface that keeps all of my ferments at proper temperature you want you want between depending on what you're doing between 85 and 90 degrees uh, fahrenheit to keep the fermentation process safe that's the temperature that the, the bacteria likes to thrive on you really are a mad scientist <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah we, i mean it comes from um all of the years of like working on music uh too because uh i had to teach myself how to do all of these strange processes with computers to figure out how to make the sounds that I heard in my head that were not coming out of instruments or anything else that I could find, you know? So I've always been really into just picking things apart and experimenting and researching and scientifically figuring out how things tick. And, you know, food is no different. Oh, it's got, I fell, fell in love with the process. And the first time I had like a truly fermented pickle, mm -hmm. I was, I was just hooked because <laughs> you, you, you get a vinegar brine pickle which is what you get at the grocery store. And those are just cucumbers boiled in hot water in a vinegar bath. Mm -hmm. And so really all you're tasting is vinegar. But when you have a truly fermented, like full sour pickle, it's it's a life changer. Wow. Well, this sounds like a lot of work to me. I'm sure it sounds like a lot of work to the average <laughs> listener. So what are the advantages of going through all this sorcery? Well, you know, it, it's interesting. It's, it's um, I wouldn't say that there's a lot of work involved. There's a lot of preparation and observation. But really, the bulk of the work is basically just like cutting up the vegetable, putting it in the, the jar, filling it with water and salt. And, you know, that takes maybe 15 minutes. And then it just sits for however long you want it to sit for. So, you know, it's not that much work. Yeah, you got to wash some jars out and stuff like that. But the benefits, um, there's some pretty compelling research uh, to show that what Lactobacillus bacteria does for gut health is pretty tremendous and people you know can feel free to research that by themselves but uh really for digestion um it's a really good digestive uh helps to you know keep that that um flora in your gut healthy mm -hmm. and thriving i've noticed that <clears throat> periods of time where i cut back or you know increase my the amount of fermented foods that i'm eating there's a definite change in like my gastro system i don't know i, th I think it's it's really nice thing to introduce into your your diet especially if you're vegan it just adds a whole bunch of new variety and, and tastes um 
like I love kimchi, but you know, you go to most uh, Asian groceries, and, uh, it, and it's not vegan. <laughs> no, it's got anchovies. Yeah. You know, so um, and I've and had I, yours, and it's amazing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's just another thing to add to your your repertoire for you know for new and exciting foods, uh, and it's nice to like feel the accomplishment of having you know made this thing at home. And I know that like going to like Central Market, there's a pickle stand that does sell truly fermented pickles, but it's like ten dollars for a quart. Yeah. So I can make the same thing at home for like, you know, one tenth the price. Right. Yeah, I think, like you said, it's just another tool in our vegan advocacy toolbox. When people say that vegan food is boring, iceberg lettuce and <laughs> carrot straws, you can say, well, actually, you can have all these amazing flavors and complexities with fermenting too, on top of the umpteen million other foods we hear about constantly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's just another thing to experiment with. And if you find something that you like, it's a nice addition, you know. Um, I, you know, I make kimchi and sauerkraut and dosa batter all the time and probably will cons- uh, consistently do that and find other things, hopefully, to, to ferment and experiment with. Can you make fermented mushrooms? Yeah, yeah, you can. You certainly can. You can ferment basically anything that has the right um, chemical composition. So if anything has um, enough sugars in it, can be fermented. But there's so many different methods. Um, there's like, you can make tempeh, which is using a mold, basically. There's, uh, in the process of sake, you know, they, they infuse the rice with a type of fungus. So it's not just um, one type. There's so many different ways to ferment things. Um, and I think you can ferment just about anything. Wait, so you're telling me I can make my own sake by fermenting? Yeah. Yeah, you can. There's kits online. Basically, all you need is the rice and the fungus and the proper environmental conditions. All right. Well, Joe Kirkner's new line of home brewed <laughs> sake is about to become a thing. <laughs> Put that basement to good use. There we go. Yeah. I look, look forward to trying it. You should. It's going to be awful. But we'll <laughs> very much get you drunk. <laughs> Well, Brian, it has been a pleasure talking with you, and I'd be remiss if I didn't give you an opportunity to have some final parting words for our listeners, whether it's about music, advocacy, veganism, fermenting foods, whatever. I'll just let you have the floor for the final comments. Sure. Well, I mean, uh, in my life, um, veganism, was, veganism has like opened up so many doors for me, um, just with types of food, a completely different understanding about myself and the world around me. And it, it really continues to evolve and inform me. And I think the biggest reason uh, how I got to this place was just keeping an open mind and really kind of trying to remove cognitive dissonance, confirmation bias, all of those things, not just for, you know, in the regards to animal rights, but for basically every aspect of my life. I'm just grateful that I was able to figure this out at a fairly early age, because I know it's something that people really struggle with uh, whether I, whether they should go vegan or not. Um, but I think that one of the other things that's interesting is most of the long-term vegans that I've met are ethical vegans. Um, I would encourage anybody to go vegan for any reason, because any reason is a good reason. Definitely. Uh, yeah. But uh, I think the thing that keeps people there um, is when they shift into that understanding of the ethical aspect of veganism. Well said. Uh, yeah. And if somebody wants to get a hold of you or learn more about your music or anything you do, what's the best way to reach you? Really? Well, I'm on Facebook. I have a YouTube channel. Uh, I think, John, you probably have the link for the YouTube channel. You can probably put that in the I sure can. description for the podcast. Sure. Yeah, the, you know, I'm on Facebook and Instagram. Um, I can give, give you the, the links for those, too. Sweet. Perfect. Thank and, you so uh, much. Yeah. Always open for collaborations and uh, doing interesting work with other musicians, so. Well, Sounds thank like you. Thank you again for being on. This has been great. A very fun conversation. I actually learned a lot. So this is fantastic. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for uh, coming on. You're very welcome. Thank you both so much for having me. Appreciate it. Yep. See ya. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Be Kind Podcast. Presented by the Animal Advocates of South Central Pennsylvania. Right, and we're back with Brian. He's going to give us a super secret Baba Ganoush recipe. <laughs> well, it's not a secret now. So, um, 
this okay this is going to be probably the most complicated bob can issue ever going to make but it is worth it 100 percent worth it so you want to get you want to make a big batch so get like three medium or two big eggplants um and then if you have access to a grill you want to get some wood chips and you want to smoke those eggplants okay. um it usually takes an hour or two until they get soft uh and then you make your standard hummus uh, and then you skin the eggplants and you mix that all up together. Here's the secret ingredient. There's a spice called sumac, similar to uh, spelled, I think, the same way as like poison sumac, but it's a completely different spice. Um, might be a little difficult to find. I get it from Saif's at Central Market in Lancaster, PA. He sells it uh, in big bags pretty cheaply. It's like a looks almost like a saffron or a paprika. It's a reddish colored spice. So you want to add a lot of that to to the mix and then i like to roast garlic and put that into but um uh fed it to many of my non-vegan friends and they tell me it's bacon paste mm. like it's as good as bacon but it's in paste form interesting yeah Bye. so it's worth it it takes a little doing but it's it's definitely worth it so not guac not hummus but baba ganoush yep that's how i roll